All right, thank you everybody for joining us today for the first in a series of webinars brought to you by the Wisconsin School of Business in partnership with the Center for Professional and Executive Development. The Wisconsin School of Business alumni webinar series aims to provide accessible, ongoing education and professional development opportunities for all Wisconsin business alumni. This year, we will offer online presentations in organizational cultural change, influencing without direct authority, and of course, change agility, which is a topic of today's program. The Wisconsin School of Business Center for Professional and Executive Development, or CPED for short, for short, partners with individuals and organizations to enhance performance and productivity through short courses, certificates, coaching, consulting, and assessments. We have more than 70 programs that we deliver annually on site here at the Fluno Center in beautiful downtown Wisconsin by instructors with practical real world experience. The Center for Professional and Executive Development also partners with a variety of organizations to provide customized on site training. For more information on CPED, please visit our website, which we have listed up there on the screen at www.uwcped.org. Today's webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to access it again later. You will also receive a survey following today's webinar, and we ask that you do take a few minutes to complete that survey. Your feedback is critical in our efforts to ensure that the content we're delivering is meaningful and relevant to you. So again, please take a few minutes to complete that survey when you receive it. Now I'd like to introduce Jeff Chan, the facilitator for today's program. Jeff is a member of our adjunct faculty here at the Center for Professional and Executive Development. He specializes in working with companies to improve organizational performance and productivity in change management and business transformation. Jeff has held general management and senior human resource positions within a variety of large international companies, and for the past 15 years has been president of Chan Management Consulting. Jeff is on the board of directors of the Association of Change Management Professionals and works to improve the field of change management through education, professional certification, and advancement of the Change Management Association. Jeff has his MA from Michigan State University in Labor and Industrial Relations. And with that, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thank you, John. Hey, thank you for everyone joining the webinar today um, and taking some time to learn about uh, change and also organizational agility. So let me uh, take a few minutes here and share with you our agenda for today. So in the next about 50 minutes or so, we're gonna talk through really four topics uh, that will help you understand where the field of change management is heading, and more importantly, understand in a recent study from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, how companies who have ad adapted their change management capabilities and really moved to more of an agility type view for the organization has grown more than 40% faster than their competitors and also grown 35% greater profitability due to their agility as an organization. So our four topics for today is really to talk through one, why organizations struggle with change and agility. What is it about the organizations and more importantly in the environments that we face today that make it difficult for organizations to continually implement change? Secondly, we'll talk about should organizations be agile or should they be stable? Uh, in short, uh, the challenge is how they view that, and many times it's not an either or question. Uh, third and fourth, we're going to talk through a framework on organizational agility to help you understand more about as organizations look to improve and grow, uh, how they become more agile and nimble to respond to marketplace challenges. So again, thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Uh, through the webinar, we're gonna be asking you some questions, some poll questions to get you involved and get your perspectives. And at the end of the presentation, uh, we're able, we're gonna share with you again, our framework and also get your feedback on how your organizations can be more change adaptable and agile. So let's uh, keep on going on. Let's, uh, let me share first around with you a term that was first uh, coined by the US Army College called VUCA. VUCA describes battle conditions that soldiers face as they look to take on their enemies, conditions that constantly change are a constant threat to their soldiers' lives. And many times uh, businesses are facing the very same conditions in terms of threats that they face to their uh, survival as a business. And VUCA really stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, and in today's world, constant change. And this constant change is making it much more challenging for businesses to continue to compete and be successful. Uh, we're living in times of greater change that are bigger, faster, more complex. And in these times of change are really driven by a multiple of different factors. Uh, first and foremost is really technology. 
over the last five to 10 years, a pace of technological changes have really been a force multiplier to the working conditions we have and how we compete in the market. Things like digitization, bioscience, uh, AI, Internet of Things, all of the things have significantly impact our ability to, as businesses to continually compete and keep pace with change. Another key driver is really on data, how organizations are using data not only as a um, uh, information about their businesses, but also data as a business unto itself. Workforce. For the first time in history, we have over we have five generations of the workforce uh, working together, all with different expectations and different perspectives on what they want out of the workplace. And lastly, another key driver is really on, on the environment. As a result of climate change, which has caused many businesses to relook at how they're looking at their environmental footprint, they're decreasing how they um, the impact they want to, they have to the environment and changing how they work. All of these are significant drivers to how organizations are competing in the marketplace. And the common theme across all of these is change. Uh, effective, effective change is critical to any one of these um, businesses that are looking to grow. And due to the VUCA environment that businesses find themselves, a critical capability for all organizations is their ability to continually change. The challenge we find is many organizations, or sorry, the, the, in a recent survey from PwC and McKinsey, a large percentage of executives highlight the importance to adapt to change and organizational agility is critical to their success. And more importantly, growing in importance. So as organizations continue to look to be agile, uh, that capability around agility is continuing to grow. Unfortunately, as businesses look to implement change, they continue to struggle to effectively implement change. Recent studies by McKinsey, Towers Watson and others show that only about 25 to 30 percent of change initiatives are successful at reaching their goals. And many of the reasons is they continue to find is the VUCA environment they live in. And most organizations use change management as a vehicle to help deal with specific change. But again, because of the pace and scope of change, it makes it difficult and insufficient in dealing with the scale of change we're looking at today. We take a look at organizations when they implement change. Uh, their primary view of change comes from initial research that was done by Kurt Lewin back in the 1940s. Part of their view or his view of change really started off, take a look at this model that says organ people find themselves in a frozen current state. And when they're in this frozen current state, they look to unfreeze, which uh, is the init first initiation step around change. And then as go, they go through unfreezing and then change and then they refreeze. This view of change was very appropriate back in the 40s and 50s. But the challenge of this view of change today is that companies don't get a chance to refreeze. They're constantly looking to change and launch more and more change. In working with several companies and communicating with hundreds and also thousands of employees over the last 20 years, the predominant mindset is when, when will all this change stop? You know, constantly employees look at when we will implement new technology, new processes, when we're gonna be done with that new process, can I go back to my day job? They separate uh, their view around change as a momentary affliction, and they wanna go back to, again, their core work as they, uh, in the work that they do. But in our environment today, that means they view change as a constant, and then we're not going to have a chance to refreeze. Businesses are struggling when they see the pace of change in the environment as exceeding the pace of change they have within their organizations. Again, change management has been a uh, focus around how we look at managing the people side of change. Since the 1980s, this change management has been continue to grow and form as a discipline and practice in the field of management. <clears throat> and as we take a look at this, it's helped in some ways, but it's not been sufficient in helping take a look at how organizations continue to be successful in our environment today. The broader challenge that organizations are facing now is how do we be agile and flexible in the face of our VUCA environment? As I shared earlier, MIT uh, study looked at organizations that are agile and responsive to changes in their market. They're realizing that over 40% they're growing faster because they're agile and 35% greater profitability due to their agility. 
So the bigger challenge for organizations is continuing to be not only how do I continue to implement change, but also how do I be agile and nimble as an organization? So John, what I'd like to do is first says, um, ask a poll question of our webinar participants around change and agility. Absolutely, I'm gonna pull up a poll question and if I could ask everybody to respond to it. So we'd like to hear from our webinar participants on a scale of one to five, how effective is your organization in implementing and sustaining change? Even some responses coming in, we'll give you another minute. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the results. All right. So most uh, respondents we see right in the middle, we implement some change, we make it, it struggle to make it sustainable, 46%. So about half the audience are right in the middle. Um, about a third of the audience uh, scored one to two, and we struggle to implement change and make it stick. And uh, there are the 3% of you out there that are great at implementing change and, make, uh, and sustaining change. And this is what we find with most organizations, they implement change, uh, but because of a number of different reasons, make it, uh, find it difficult to sustain the change. Uh, very much what I use is analogy around a rubber band. As you stretch out that rubber band is when you implement the change, but the tension and forces in the organization continue to want that uh, rubber band to retract and go back to where it was before. And uh, one of the key challenges around change is how do we make it stick? And part of the challenge around making it stick is uh, right when we've implemented the change, along comes another change that many times undermines that initial change. So let's take a look, John, at uh, the second question around organizational agility. Uh, the question really is how, on a scale of one to five, how agile and change adaptive and nimble is your organization uh, to respond to external market forces? One, you're very rigid and struggle to adapt to change. Uh, three, make some changes and are agile in some ways. And five, you're highly responsive to market volatility. So again, thanks for voting on the first one. Love to hear from the group on how agile and change adaptive is your organization. I see responses coming in. We'll give it another few seconds. Right. Yeah, and as you as we go through the presentation today, at the end of our presentation, we'll save the last uh, 10 minutes or so for any Q&A. So as we go through this webinar, please uh, submit any questions you have to John, and we'll review those questions as we go through the webinar. All right, let's take a look at the results. All right. Very similar to uh, the first one, we have about a third of the audience that are really uh, scores one or two were rigid and struggle to adapt to change. Uh, about half the audience right in the middle, we make some changes in Agile in some ways. And again, there's about three, four percent of you that are highly responsive to market volatility, which is awesome to see. Again, so much of what we do at the University of Wisconsin CPAD organization is help organizations improve their capabilities and agility. And um, let's take, we'll, we'll continue talking about agility and really our focus is really on how do we look at organizations that are, are rigid and struggle to adapt to change and even some organizations that implement change but are uh, need to have a broader view of agility. So John, if we can get back to the presentation. Right. All right, so let's take a look at the broader view and why organizations struggle with change and part of it is where we've come from. So for the last hundred years, uh, we've had a view around organizations that really started with Ford Motor Company. So Ford Motor Company in 1910 was one of many small automo automobile manufacturing companies. In a short 10 years later, uh, Ford Motor Company had over 60% of the market share. And part of what they were accomplished was they initially had uh, time to produce a car was over 12 hours and they reduced that to 90 minutes. And the cost to produce a car was $850 down to less than 
dollars. Unprecedented time of efficiency and growth. You might be asking yourself, how in the world did uh, Henry Ford was able to accomplish in that short amount of time the significant change he was able to accomplish? Well, part of, part of what he did was able to work with Frederick Taylor. Frederick Taylor was a researcher uh, uh, around organizational science and really applied scientific management theory to f how uh, Henry Ford looked at uh, man making cars and significantly ch changed the manufacturing process and really optimized labor productivity. A lot of his initial ideas really led to things around total quality control, project management, and so much of the view around uh, the organization was around how do we look at organizations as a machine to try and gain control and efficiency. So that initial view really spawned for the last 100 years, our management view of organizations primarily as a machine. So as we take a look at organizations, our organization structure, we looked at, again, a very mechanistic view of the organization. And this traditional view of the organization, we looked at our people and our, and our organization structure, how do we best fine tune it? So in these traditional organizations, for the last 100 years, it's really been focused around control and efficiency and long-term planning. Uh, I remember uh, 20 years ago when I first large, worked for a large oil company, they had planning cycles of 15 to 20 years, how they took, took a look at oil fields and chemical plants and oil refineries and markets that they're looking to compete long-term cycles uh, and it was done within a an environment that was well known that uh, highly stable and changed very little uh, part of also traditional organizations were very much linear planning uh, to focus on high efficiency and execution and so much of the way they made decisions was really governance at the top leadership teams made the majority of decisions and they really viewed organizations as a static siloed structural hierarchy Again, so much of this really helped spawn the, the success we've had in the last 100 years. These established companies that have used this model have had, had a history of success uh, that's relied on management hierarchy. A real classical view of managing organizations through planning and control and efficiency, really through this top-down management, uh, through job descriptions, boxes, lines, structures, standard operating procedures, really running and controlling things from the top. Again, this approach has been successful the last 100 years, but the challenges we face now is this core strength for businesses is now limiting their ability to respond to change. Because so much of this overall organization structure is rigid and slow moving, but also highly efficient. So again, as companies look to be responsive to market and customer needs, the scale of change that we're seeing today, it's overcoming many organizations and this mechanistic view of organizations is both a limiting factor. So what we see today is many times organizations, how they respond to these change pressures, they look to restructure. This is the favorite management tool when companies are underperforming and struggle with organizational performance. Many times they'll look to restructure. And the challenge is they restructure with a mindset around a mechanistic view. So they continue to restructure to refine the organization to figure out what their new roles are, how to allocate resources and power, and really around the hierarchy around oversight. And they really define this mechanistic view with processes that are very precise and deliberate, and really uh, drive employees to rely on rules and handbooks and priorities to really execute tasks. As organizations continue to look to restructure, the problem that they find is that the, when they implement a structure and look to continually restructure, companies typically take about one to two years to restructure, to implement the structure, sustain it. But again, the challenge is once, once they've implemented it, it's time to move on to the next organization structure, time to move on to the next change. In a recent study by McKinsey, they said over half the companies are looking to make some significant structural change, but they do that every two to three years. And when uh, when surveyed by the executive, when surveyed, the executive said that over 23% of the redesigns were deemed successful. So the majority of them were unsuccessful, and also majority of them actually destroyed value in the organization. You might be asking why do these companies redes redesign themselves so frequently? because they look at this from a mechanistic view. They continue to go back to the drawing board to figure out how do we refine the organization, but the challenge is in today's fast-changing world, this approach results in almost constant disruption and change fatigue. 
So the challenge is how do we look at organizations? So that emerging view around organizations is how we look at it from an organizational agility perspective. Agile as a approach started off in software in the IT world around software development uh, and first got started because organizations really struggle with uh, the waterfall approach to software development. A lot of inefficiencies and disconnects between the business and IT. Uh, the Agile approach really scaled now to projects and now really taking a look at a lot of organizations scale to much broader principles applied to how organizations are run. So what we need is really organizations that are agile, organizations that are able to identify and capture opportunities more quickly than competitors at both operational levels and also strategic levels. And these strategic changes or operational changes is really more about your core business. When you look at the core aspects of your business today and the core customers that you serve today, how do you continue to serve those, but also at a strategic level, it's around where the future of your business is going. What's the new business model, the new products, the new services, the new markets you're gonna go after uh, that's different than where your current businesses are. Agile organizations also take advantage of planned or unexpected uh, changes in the market with speed, effectiveness, and flexibility. A small percentage of you identified in that survey, you guys do a great job of that today. But for the majority of the organizations, they struggle with, uh, again, the unexpected and executing that with speed and flexibility. Uh, also, they are able to transform insight from the market and be very responsive to what the changes in the market are. And they adapt quickly to change uh, and effectively reconfig reconfigure their strategy, their structure, their people and process and technology towards uh, value creating and also value protecting opportunities. So as we take a look at these organizations that are more and more agile, uh, I was working with an organization recently in the Chicago area, and as we're taking a look at adopting more and more agile principles, uh, so many of the leaders says, that's great, we love agile, let's uh, uh, abandon and throw out all our processes and all our standard operating procedures. And I said, wait, that's not the thing to do, because uh, so many times organizations really view Agile uh, and the problems they face today or the issues they face today as a problem. And what I would like to suggest is this question that uh, many times business leaders are facing, this question is, should we be Agile or should we be stable and efficient? And I would suggest uh, some of the work that uh, Barry Johnson did years ago from the University of Toledo. He took a look at this whole area around, are we facing a problem today or are we facing a polarity? So a problem is many times can be defined as a situation that with a clear solution and clear issue, clear issue that needs to be addressed. But many times in our complex VUCA world that we face today, we're facing polarities. And a polarity is an del ongoing dilemma that we face and many times is unsolvable and contains seemingly opposite ideas. And these polarities are interdependent and really connected to each other. And what I mean by that, let me share with you some examples. So businesses today face this issue on, is it a problem or is it really more of a polarity? Should we, be, should we grow or should we be profitable? Should we focus on the long term or should we focus on the short term? And the answer to that is always yes, you need to be able to do both. Should we centralize or should we decentralize? And I'll share with you an example in a minute there. But these polarities are very much, when you think about it, it's very much like you're, bre you're breathing. Well, should I inhale or should I exhale? You can't do one, continue to do one without doing the other. And organizations uh, in facing these polarities need to have both. So let me share with you what I mean by this, we're sharing an example. When or, one of the continual challenges organizations face is should I be centralized or should I be decentralized? And they view this as two ends of a continuum. And for both the polarities on the centralized and also the decentralized, there's pluses to both of these type of organization structures, but there's also negatives to both of these types of organizational structures. So the pluses for being centralized, you have strong standards and control, high levels of efficiency, functional excellence. And what I mean by a centralized organization structure, many times those are organized by functions, uh, sales and marketing and IT and finance and HR, operations, supply chain. 
where those functions really across the multiple businesses set the standards, set controls, and really drive efficiencies to the organization. But there's also many positives to being decentralized. As we look at organizations that are decentralized, again, form primarily around customers or markets or product areas. They are closer to the customer, responsive to market changes. They're much more flexible and uh, higher levels of autonomy. But again, that are more responsive to their businesses, uh, the needs of their customers. And as a result, their businesses are, again, more flexible and nimble. As we take a look at it, both of these ends of the continuum also have negatives to them. So on the decentralized side, many times highly decentralized organizations have redundant processes and resources. So across the multiple business units, they have redundant resources, redundant people, uh, redundant uh, technologies or equipment or capital equipment. They also lack standards and controls across. Also on the centralized side, on the centralized side of the organization or uh, polarity, things can be, if you're highly centralized, you can be bureaucratic, inflexible, rigid, slow moving, all those different elements. And what many times what happens for then for organizations is they find them on the negative side of one of these polarities. So last year I was working with one organization that was heavily organized by business units, multiple business units, and part of what they realized was the highly inefficient structure, uh, redundant people and processes and roles and, and technologies across. So what they said was, because we are so decentralized today, where Nirvana would be is if we were to centralize as an organization. So what they attempted to do was swing the pendulum from being decentralized to centralized. And as they wanted to say, we want to drive higher land stand, higher levels of standards and controls, of efficiency and functional excellence, when they see this as a problem to be solved and not recognizing the value and benefits of both sides, they started actually dropping down after they implemented structure. That structure drove to high levels of bureaucracy and inflexible and rigid as these functional leaders continue to drive higher levels of efficiency and control. They weren't responsive to the marketplace. So what we see for many organizations when they swing the pendulum from one side of, of, of the process of decentralized to centralized, a few years later, they come back and say, you know what, we're experiencing so much of the negative of centralized, let's swing the pendulum back over to being decentralized. And uh, this cycle happens time and time again. Every time I teach a class at UW CPAD and, and talk to clients, they continually see the swing of the pendulum back and forth because they see this as a problem to be solved. So this issue that we face around, again, you can replace centralized and decentralized, with should we be agile or should we be stable? The issue is we need to be both. Organizations have to be both stable, meaning they have to have processes and structures and governance that are resilient, highly reliable and efficient. And where we see many organizations today are at that level. They have a lot of structures and processes and controls in place. You also have to be dynamic, nimble, uh, flexible, adaptive uh, to what the um, changes or, or forces you're facing in the marketplace. So companies need to design their structure and governance and processes really to support both. They have to have core elements of the business that focus around how do we be the most efficient, highest quality, highest service to our existing customer base and responsive to those needs. But they also have to have structures and governance and processes in place that are dynamic and agile to be able to support new challenges and new opportunities and new issues that pop up in the market. So agile organizations that are truly uh, high levels of stability and high levels of uh, being fast and nimble are very rare and also are an, an emerging need for many businesses. And many of the businesses that we work with, again, are highly stable and they're struggling to find out how do we be more dynamic and uh, nimble. A framework that McKinsey came across that really, I think, uh, describes this really well on how do we be both agile and stable. So in this two by two matrix on the horizontal axis, is we have stability and efficiency. So we have uh, elements of organizations that could be weak on the left-hand side, 
and then organizations that are strong on the right-hand side. And then on the vertical axis, we have organizations that may be dynamic and flexible. So we have weak and also strong. And so organizations that are weak in terms of stability and efficiency, but also weak in terms of how flexible and dynamic they are, they are as an organization trapped. Uh, how McKinsey would characterize it is their inability to really be efficient in how they serve their customers and also inability to be responsive to market changes and volatility in the marketplace. You don't see these businesses last very long. So if you uh, have a business that is in a trapped environment, again, uh, many times they will uh, not be around for very long. Organizations, that we see a lot of startup organizations that are really flexible, very autonomous, respond to all the different needs of the business, of, of, of market conditions, but they're very inefficient. So we see a lot of startup organizations, uh, and especially a lot of uh, tech startups uh, find themselves this way because they're so focused on the customer, they're not able to scale and continue to grow uh, and be efficient and really drive high elements of stability because again, they're so flexible. Where we see most organizations is really down in the bottom right. Uh, on the bottom right, we see organizations that are traditional, that are highly efficient and stable, but also mechanistic, bureaucratic, slow moving. I uh, was just working with an organization this last week and a large insurance company in the Chicago area, and they would characterize themselves as again, very efficient and stable, but very slow moving and inflexible in terms of how they're able to respond to market conditions. So we take a look at organizations that are, again are high in terms of their stability and efficiency, but also high in terms or, or strong in terms of being dynamic and flexible. It's really organizations that are agile. These agile organizations where most businesses are wanting to head to, again, have high elements of both uh, stability and efficiency, and also their ability to respond to marketplace challenges. So John, let's uh, launch our second poll question here around uh, getting a sense where we see uh, folks on the webinar and where they see their organization. So what we like to do is ask you a question, what quadrant do you see your business in? Are you in being a tra in trapped in quadrant one? Are you a startup organization in quadrant two? you find yourself more in quadrant three in a traditional organization? Or are you one of those rare organizations that are both high levels of stability and efficiency, but also really strong in terms of being dynamic and flexible? All right, I see some responses coming in. And as you're doing that, I wanna tell everybody as well, you'll see a small orange arrow in the top right of your screen. If you click on that, that'll expand your control panel and you can submit questions using the question function in that panel. So again, just click on that orange orange arrow at the top of your screen. All right, the responses are continuing to come in. We'll give it another minute or two. Great. Okay, let's take a look at the results. Uh, yep, so very much what we anticipate for most organizations uh, that we see. Uh, some organizations are trapped. Again, that's a challenging place to be that you are, are, don't have defined processes or roles or structures in place to be really efficient. Uh, some are, and also inability to really be flexible to marketplace challenges. A lot of organizations are in their startup. 16% start of you are in your startup. Uh, again, high levels, very flexible and dynamic, but have not taken the opportunity to improve in terms of efficiency and defining processes and improvement. The majority of organizations really find a traditional, and you, you scaled as an organization and have been successful, and a core part of your business is around serving existing customer needs. What we see is so much of that business is under attack. You know, what I shared with you earlier, working with a large insurance business, in this large insurance business, they see their traditional competitors, other large insurance businesses, but what they're seeing more and more and becomes more of a threat are their non-traditional competitors, tech startups, uh, venture funds, uh, private equity. They're venturing or they're moving into their insurance space with whole new business models, whole new ways of taking a look at how better to serve their customers' needs. And, and as a result, they're a significant shift and take a look at how they're doing their business. 
So again, this uh, John, I think this poll question again re really reaffirms where we see a lot of organizations that are highly efficient. Again, I would say in the last 10 to 20 years, it has been such great work done around uh, continuous improvement and lean and Six Sigma and process improvement, all great things. Uh, but also another element of where organizations need to head is very much around how do we be agile and nimble and flexible. So we can get back to the PowerPoint. All right. So as organizations recognize the need to be able to improve, again, to, not to abandon uh, their heritage around being highly stable and highly efficient and a lot of controls, the answer to improve agility is not to abandon that legacy and the strength of an organization, but really to build on top of that to be able to say, how do we be more agile? And uh, we borrow from this uh, process improvement capability maturity model that say, this journey to be uh, more organizationally agile can't be a flavor of the month. It has to be around how do we build organizational agility uh, disciplines in terms of practices and uh, management uh, capability over time. And we see most organizations as they continue every year to tackle a different part in terms of different management practices, new processes and new ways of improving and growing over time uh, and uh, improving that uh, in, in these different areas. And we take a look at management practices, I'll share with you an example. So organizational agility management practices, one of the key areas is really around how we do planning and goal setting. So in a traditional organization, most organizations, how they set goals, they go through an elaborate annual goal setting process that if, it, if your calendar year, uh, or sorry, if your fiscal year is a calendar year, so in the fall, they typically spend a lot of time uh, working through establishing annual goals and plans in the September, October, November timeframe, launch then annual goals in the first quarter of the following year. Uh, goals are deployed and cascaded through the organization through formal mechanisms. But what happens though is once they've gone through that annual exercise, there's a real disconnect between those plans and goals and what the day-to-day -day work of the teams are. There isn't a real ability then to respond and adjust and react to any marketplace changes. So there's a disconnect again across the enterprise view of our plans and goals with the day-to-day -day work of the business, with the needs of the business. And uh, from a performance review perspective, many times what we see for leaders is they do the annual performance review, but it doesn't reflect at all anything that happens on a monthly or quarterly basis across the organization. So this traditional view, again, this, these processes were very effective in an environment and in market conditions that were stable, relatively unchanged, and when you're able to set annual goals and execute that with an environment that doesn't change, that's the exact right process and the right, exact right disciplines. But in the, in, the in the VUCA world that we're seeing today, we need us so that we are more responsive. So we see with Agile organizations, they set goals on a more uh, quarterly or more frequent basis and update those across the organization. These goals are adjusted as priorities change. So what they have is they have their uh, frontline employees, they have empl uh, managers and leaders in tune with what's going on in the marketplace. And as they take a look at where it's going on in the marketplace, they're able to then translate what's going on on the inside, outside into priorities on the inside. So they adjust their priorities, they review performance frequently. And again, uh, goals and plans are updated uh, based upon external changes on a much more frequent basis. So the planning goal setting changes uh, not only in terms of frequency, so how often plans and goals are set, but also the focus and the framework in terms of how they look at setting goals. It's are we setting goals in terms of um, unchangeable, unmovable actions? Are we looking to learn from what's going on in the market and what's learning from our businesses? Another key area in terms of management practices for organizational agility is how we allocate resources. So in traditional organizations, resources or people are owned by their managers and many times the uh, predominant theme is when we have siloed organizations we can't share resources or costs or we struggle to be able to identify what changes need to happen in terms of our people priorities across this business 
So these siloed um, practices from different functions around sales or marketing and operations supply chain. But when a market condition exists and it, uh, uh, challenges exist, it's not going to cleanly hit any one of those functions. Many times it uh, happens across. So again, I use that example from the insurance industry I just worked with uh, this last week. Uh, some of their frontline folks that work in customer service that receive feedback from the customers. As they're receiving feedback from customers in the customer service area, they struggle to communicate from customer service into operations and then also connect with sales because they don't have mechanisms in place to not only connect the silos, but also communicate so they're able to respond effectively with new priorities and how they're gonna better serve their customers. We also see our resources are spread across multiple projects with little clarity on what priorities we face as a business. So in traditional organizations, again, uh, resources are siloed and we're not able to share across. In highly agile organizations, we have much more of a cross-functional team approach where resources, meaning our people, our budget, and what our focus are, are deployed and redeployed through a systematic process uh, across the organization to evaluate where initiatives are, what type of resources we need, and how do we move those people across the organization to where the needs are and within the business. So as we take a look at it, these management practices are ultimately at the core of what needs to change for organizations to move from being highly traditional, highly bureaucratic, or highly siloed as a, as a business to being much more agile as an organization. What we've done uh, through the University of Wisconsin CPED is establish this organizational agility framework. And this framework has uh, multiple elements that take a look at highly agile organizations and what they do. And again, highly agile organizations have multiple elements that both support your core stable business, but also support the future in terms of where we need to go and uh, elements of strategic agility. So our organizational agility framework starts first with leadership and management practices, the disciplines and practices of our leaders and how well they communicate, how well our leaders really influence others. In a traditional organization, they influence others through hierarchical authority. So many times I see organizations that uh, leaders that because of their title, because of their uh, uh, VP title or director title, they drive authority and they're the ones primarily making decisions. In highly agile organizations, leaders influence through coaching and development uh, rather than their hierarchical authority. Management practices, again, for frontline managers, how they're developing their teams, developing their employees to have an external view of their business, knowledge of how the organization work. There's a whole set of management practices uh, and leadership practices that organization or, or organizations that are highly agile that are different than traditional organizations. How another element of their framework is around uh, organizations that are highly agile, how they do planning and goal setting. I shared with you on the previous slide an example of organizations in terms of how they change their planning processes. Again, it's not just a frequency, but it's also the focus of the planning and how they have mechanisms in place to learn from what's going on in the market and adapt and change their uh, plans and goals. How another practice is around performance review, resource management processes, and a whole set of disciplines and practices around that. Here in the middle, we have two different elements, how businesses run the current business and the focus around this part is really around stability and efficiency and quality against your core business. And what we need here in terms of agility is more operational agility. Operational agility, you can think about it in terms of uh, continuous improvement. How do we continuously improve our current book of business with our current customers, our current services and products, and continuously improve and be agile and respond to uh, feedback we're getting from our customers in terms of changes that are needed, but also an element of how do we change the business? How do we start thinking about what's the future of our business in terms of new business models, new products, new markets, new regions, new services, and it's really around our, our strategic agility that we can innovate and drive new ways of working. And core to this part of strategic agility is really how do you take the data from the market and innovate 
but then also how do you take that data and really iterate and experiment with new models, new products and new services. And again, we talked earlier about that whole agile process and agile methodology. This is very applicable here in terms of how businesses uh, learn and innovate and drive new business, new business directions for their organization. And the last area really deals with employees and culture. So at the, at the foundation, or early on I talked about having five generations of work, uh, of the workforce uh, working today. Each one of those generations have a different view around agility in terms of res their personal resilience, how uh, they're able to learn new skills, learn uh, new ways of working, how adaptable, how change responsive they are. Highly agile organizations, have practices and dis disciplines in place to really do multiple things. One, they help their employees continually have a view of the external market. Some businesses that I talk to, their employees rarely even know who the customers are, what the market conditions are, uh, what the challenges are, what the, who their competitors are. So highly agile organizations, uh, the employees have a, a strong sense of who their competitors are and also what the competitive, how we, how they compete with those uh, in the marketplace. Other disciplines they also have is helping their employees continually grow and learn. So they allocate budget in terms of dollars and also time to let employees grow and learn. So they're continually being personally agile and learning new skills. So this framework lays out multiple areas, a number of different management practices and disciplines that are needed for organizations to be highly agile. Um, that concludes our presentation, but again, what I want to do is summarize to say organizations, uh, because of the environment that we face today in terms of VUCA, volatile, uncertain, uh, complex, and ambiguous, the, the predominant view of organizations as a machine, a mechanistic view, is no longer a sufficient model. We have to think about how do we both be stable as an organization, but also be agile and applying these different framework and disciplines. If you're interested in learning more about the organizational agility framework and also about the agility practices, uh, on the screen we have John's contact information and also on the follow-up survey, uh, you'll receive some of that information. So John, if uh, we can uh, do now is open up the line for any questions. Uh, if you have questions around uh, organizational change and organizational agility, uh, I'd be happy to take any of those questions now. All right, thanks Jeff. I have been gathering questions as we've gone through the program today. So I'm gonna go through the list here and we'll get to as many as we have time to. So the first Jeff is how do businesses who are used to doing things a certain way change the mindset of their employees who may view change negatively? Sure. Uh, I love that. I love that question because before you're able to effectively change processes and practices, the first thing that has to change is really mindsets. And I would say it's not initially. It's not going to be the mindsets of employees. It has to be the mindsets of the leaders that initially change. And when you take a look at the mindsets that need to change from a leadership perspective. They have to first understand what is it, uh, again, one of the key principles around effective change is to never disrespect the past. So your organization structure in terms of your uh, business model, your processes, your technologies, how you've run your business in the last 10 years has been the right business model to serve your business if you've been a successful growing business. But because of the environment that we face, in turn, again, the VUCA world that we face, because of the constantly changing market conditions, that business model, that structure, that process, that technology is no longer sufficient to be a viable model moving forward as a business. So in order to change mindsets, you have to help people understand what's going on in the environment that's gonna, that says your business model and the practices you have are no longer a viable approach to how you're gonna compete. So in changing that mindset, look to the outside. What's going on in the outside? Competitive factors that will limit your ability to be successful as an organization. Great, thank you, Jeff. And what are some of the best tactics you can share for a large company to migrate from a traditional mindset to an agile mindset around change? 
what I would say, I, I think it relates back to the first question. Again, this, this migration or movement is really around how do we as a business continue to look to the outside and identify what practices need to change. So what I would encourage you to do if you want to learn more about these management practices is contact John. We can send you more information about the 20 plus management practices that are needed and then also um, be happy to help you with a survey and in this survey you're able to identify where you're at in terms of current um, um, manager practices in terms of how uh, trapped you are how are you in the startup are you in the bureaucratic or traditional or and also where you need to be in terms of agile so Great, thank you. We had a couple questions around metrics and measurement, Jeff. So what metrics are used in change management um, and organizational agility and including lead indicators and lag indicators? And how do you use those to measure an organization's progress um, moving to an, an agile mindset? Sure. Um, I would say two things here in terms of measures. So from a metrics perspective, in, the, in a traditional change management project, metrics has to first start off with what are the intended business results that change is looking to improve so if you're looking to impl implement a new erp system or some new technology what's the end outcome of that new technology how is that going to help you um, improve your operations be more efficient be more profitable as a business identify those outcome business results and then working backwards from that, those business results, identify then what are the behaviors that need to change to effectively implement that change and achieve those business results. And what I always do with from a uh, change management perspective is really measure change adoption. What percentage of adoption of behavior adoptions are people adopting those new and different behaviors that are all ultimately drive those business results? Same thing from an organizational agility perspective, as we start identifying then processes and practices in terms of what are the um, behaviors that are needed to drive new agile behaviors, new agile processes, and what's a business result, we're able to measure those leading indicators around behavior change. All right, thank you. Now, Jeff, you had touched on um, the need to re-examine how goals are being set and measured. So yes. do you have um, any insight as to how um, organizations can set longer term directions and goals so that they can be agile on annual, quarterly, and even a daily basis? Um, sure. And then as a related to that, um, any ideas on how organizations can measure and reward people against those goals as they progress towards them over time? Sure. So uh, uh, it goes back to should we set long term goals or should we set short term goals? And the answer is yes. Uh, you need to be able to set both a longer term vision and direction that really sets uh, a broad highway or broad roadmap for where you as a business need to go. But recognizing that within that broad roadmap, there has to be uh, bumpers or boundaries of where, where is a business you want to head. But recognizing that that path is going to be fairly wide. And as you set quarter, monthly or quarterly goals and plans uh, in the short term, as you set those plans and goals, it's all about learning what's going on in the market. And what's As you implement that new product or roll out that new service, what is the market telling you in terms of the responsiveness of that uptake for that new product or service that fits within that short-term plan that fits within the broader long-term plan? Great, thank you. And Jeff, can you speak to any of the unique challenges that non-traditional matrix organized organizations might face when trying to utilize these principles to, um, again, achieve an agile mindset? Um, I'm sorry, so you say non, non-traditional non matrix organizations? That's correct. Yeah, I would say for uh, matrix organizations, that is it definitely a organizational design intended to be able to help really drive connections across from a functional perspective and also from a business unit or customer perspective. And I really do like the matrix organization as a design to be able to help drive high levels of efficiency and controls and standards, again, from a centralized perspective, but also it's a mechanism to be driving that uh, responsiveness to the customers and the markets that you work within. So as a matrix model that works well, it is really around the, the ability to be able to pull priorities and set resources across that matrix that is a critical to be able to, again, um, move from an agility perspective to high levels of efficiency and control. All right, thank you. 
And in terms of culture and organizational values, can you talk about how um, a shift to an agile change management mindset might impact those two elements? Sure. Yeah, the culture is a key enabler to be able to work within a highly agile organization. Let me give you an example. So again, I share with you, I worked with a large insurance company and when the, in this large insurance company, they attempted in the last five years to implement various new services and new technology. And the predominant mindset that the leadership had was these ventures and what they had were failures. That predominant mindset that said, we tried something, it failed, it didn't work. Let's uh, abandon that effort and move on to the next new thing. Um, from a, which uh, that mindset and that culture and was communicated through the organization was very much of that traditional mindset that we're gonna try something and we're gonna implement it. If it doesn't work, that effort was a failure and let's abandon that effort and move on to the next one. So the people that worked on that effort were demoralized um, they, they felt like a failure, they viewed it as failure. Organizations that are highly agile, the mindset and the culture is significantly different. And the difference is they don't view those things as a failure, they view those very much as a learning opportunity. So when we rolled out this new service, rolled out that new technology, what did we learn about what didn't work and what adjustments do we have to make? Because again, the environment that we live in is constantly changing. And as it's constantly changing, what worked this year may not work two, three years down the road. So how are we continue to remain flexible and adaptable and learn and pivot? So organizations, again, that are highly agile, take the mindsets of leaders and take the culture and move it from a failure perspective to say, what do we learn and how can we grow and improve and change as a result of that? All right, thank you, Jeff. And can you give any advice for a team that's currently going through a restructure on how to work through it successfully despite a top-down imposition of the new structure? I'm sorry, that last part, a top-down? Uh, imposition of the new structure. Hmm. Well, I see a lot of organizations that when the midst of a restructure, uh, it is very much dictated from senior leaders around what that new model is. Uh, and what I would say is, uh, how do you, within that broader structure from a bottom-up view uh, is very much of a socio-technical redesign. How do we take a look at our customers and our processes and our people and how do we design then processes that are enabling that within the broader macro structure? Uh, and, and in the short amount of time, it's hard to be able to answer that, but when I do organizations that design, there's always a top-down view, the macro level structure, and then the bottom of you that really is are on the details or how do we best serve our customers within that model. So what I what my advice would be is we can make any high, macro level structure work by looking first at your customers and how best you serve them. Great, thank you, Jeff. And thank you everybody who um, took the time to attend today's session. We're unfortunately out of time, so we won't be able to respond to any additional questions. Um, but I do, again, want to thank everybody for attending. And Jeff, we want to thank you for sharing your expertise and insights with us all today. Um, and don't forget, we have two additional webinars coming up here over the next several months. Catalyzed Performance through Cultural Transformation will be held on July 17th. And then Mastering the Power of Influence will be held on September 25th. And you'll be receiving more information about both of those in the future as well. Um, we hope you can join us there. And in the meantime, as I mentioned at the top, you will be receiving a survey about today's webinar in your email in the next day or so. So please keep an eye out for that. And included with that email will be a link to a recording of today's program as well. So again, Jeff, thank you for sharing your insights with us. And thank you, everybody, for taking the time out of the day to join us. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.